Hello, welcome to Solution Based News. I'm your host, Nora Costley, and today's episode is How to Help Immigrants and Address the Border Crisis. <coughs> we have a panel of four activists, community organizers, and an attorney who are going to help us look at solutions to this international crisis. Um, here to my right is Catherine Foster, who is an immigrant rights activist and the ORD2 Indivisible and on the ORD2 Indivisible Steering Committee. Yeah. Um, what is the what is Indivisible's goal, and how is that connected with our agenda here today to practice tolerance? Oh, thanks for inviting me, Nora. It's a privilege to be on this panel. Um, Thank you for coming. Sure. Uh, Indivisible is a grassroots organization that uh, sprang up after Trump was elected and its aims are to uh, elect progressive officials, restore our democracy, and defeat the Trump agenda. So there are many aspects of the Trump agenda that, that we're fighting, but uh, at the top of the list is the cruelty um, of this administration in how it treats people who are lawfully seeking asylum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we are horrified at the attempts to stop people at the border, uh, separating children from their families, and the horrific conditions that people are held in. Um, so one of the things that Indivisible does it, is it holds rallies, and we've had a number of rallies on the issue of immigration and sometimes we've partnered with UNITE and Unite Oregon. Uh, we also make a lot of phone calls to our members of Congress, Senators Wyden and Merkley and Representative Walden. And uh, individual members call them all the time, expressing their displeasure with uh, the administration's harsh actions and policies. Wow. Well, thank you for mm -hmm. so much for all that work that you're doing. Sure. And thank you for being here. Um, and now introducing um, immigration attorney and second generation Mexican immigrant, John Almaguer. Hi, thanks for having me. When did your parents achieve citizenship and how long did it take them? Well, my parents came in in the 60s, and uh, as they were both graduates from medical school, my father is a doctor and my mother was a nurse, uh, there was a need, and so they came into this country as residents. Uh, my father, as a matter of fact, was uh, um, drafted into the Air Force where he served as a captain during Vietnam, uh, but in San Bernardino, California, where I was born. Uh, they didn't get their naturalization, become U.S. citizens, until I was in law school. And so when they were going through their process, it was something that I, mm -hmm. I found interesting. Um, and being a Latino, I, I felt compelled to, to learn about the process and what they were doing. So yeah, that, that uh, my family's history did encourage me to uh, learn about immigration law and see how I could help other people. And they wanted to hold on to their their privileges as Mexican citizens for a while? Uh, when, when you became a, a mm -hmm. um, U.S. citizen, for f countries will, will determine whether you give up your naturalization in right. that country. And Mexico at the time, if you became a U.S. citizen, you lost your, your legal status in mm -hmm. Mexico, so you could have known property and, and things of that nature. So when, when those laws became less strict, um, that's when my parents decided that it was time for them to, okay. to naturalize. And, and so it that just they happened can, to be when you were in law school. It, it was uh, yeah. fortuitous, I think, yeah. for some, and maybe yeah. not for others. Yeah. <laughs> um, to my left, be, um, we have Bianca Marcela Bayera, activist, community organizer for Beyond Toxics. Did I say that right? You said my name right. Yeah, okay, thank you. awesome. Mm -hmm. um, as a child of Cuban immigrants, you believe what we lack in privilege, we make up for in knowledge or importance of family and land's integrity. In your speech at, ha at the March to End Human Detention, you spoke about rural areas being less inviting for marginalized citizens, um, like the Rogue Valley that we live in, and in more nature 
Ridge Valley, rich areas being less accessible for marginalized communities like immigrants. Can you expand a little bit more on that? I would love to. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for the invite. Thank you for coming. And I'm really honored to be at this round table with other champions for human rights in the Rogue Valley. It means so much. Um, thank you for all of your work. Um, yeah, I would love to talk about how uh, rural America and rural Southern Oregon in particular, where we live, um, could be a more inviting and welcoming place for the immigrant community as well as communities of color. Um, and a lot of it really has to do with some statistics. According to the USDA in a recent report called Who Owns the Land, 98% um, of the land in America is owned by white Americans. And another statistic is that approximately 70% of the people who do farm work, so do seasonal migrant and farm work in this country who work the land, are uh, people of color, especially Latinx community. So right away you have um, a picture of who it is that owns the land in this country and mm -hmm. who works the land. Wow. So that's rural America in a nutshell. And I think that already kind of sets up why it is that there's an unequal power structure mm -hmm. and situation when it comes to living rurally. Um, and yeah, and right. does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, you know, and then other reasons involve unequal wealth distribution in this country. Um, so white Americans in general have the inherited wealth and the assets and the access to uh, wealth and assets to own land. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas people of color um, who maybe have a longer time in this country as well as have less or unequal uh, opportunities to wealth and to job opportunities, um, don't have the same assets to, to buy and own land. So they tend to cluster in cities. Um, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm, right. And don't have the same opportunity to mm -hmm. buy land and to have the great American dream of you know several acres and a farm and growing your own food. Um, but a lot of it also has to do with cultures of safety. Yeah, that's uh, what I was thinking as well. Yeah, safety. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Not feeling safe. Yeah, because, um, because there's so many um, such a preponderance of the, of the white community in rural America. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also huge KKK um, right, yeah. history um, and also histories of just white supremacist culture, mm -hmm. um, right wing conservatist culture. Um, communities of color tend to cluster with their own kind in cities um, where there's also, uh, there tend to be more universities, higher degrees of education, um, more progressive politics. Um, mm -hmm. So it just, they provide safe havens as right. well as more job opportunities um, as well. Right, yeah. more diversity. And more diversity, exactly. So it has a lot to do with wealth. It has a lot to do with mm -hmm. um, inability to buy and own land in this country mm -hmm. um, so far and, uh, and has a lot to do with feelings of safety. And it'd be great for all of those things to change. Yeah, yeah, I definitely, thank mm -hmm. you so much. Absolutely. Um, Nick, immigration rights activist and the first environmental justice organizer for UNITE. Thank you for joining us here tonight. That's good to be um, here. Or today, rather. It feels like night in here. Uh, what kind of work does UNITE do? Well, UNITE does a variety of work with various members of our community. We do work with helping getting people registered to vote. We do work with the state legislature to try and pass bills and reforms that will improve lives for immigrants and also other people throughout the state. We work with local representatives as well. We talk with them about issues that are going on and affecting the community. We also work with Medford Police and the Jackson County Sheriffs to try and help them to improve policies or how they might interact with Latinos or other people in our community so that everyone feels more comfortable working with them and helping to keep our communities safe. We also do a lot of work to help get out the vote for the Latino community. Mm -hmm. We help them as well with other issues and also the general community in large because we help to register people for the Oregon Health Plan so they can get yeah, health insurance if they're low income. That's something we've just started doing in the past few years. We got a grant and we have a worker whose name's Christian who helps sign people up mm -hmm. onto OHP and that's been uh, very successful, I think. Have, have you guys found here, because I know in other um, areas of the country that um, like minorities and marginalized communities can have a harder time voting 
due to different policies? Is, do you guys find that here? Well, one nice thing about Oregon is we use the mail-in ballot system. Yeah. So it makes it a lot easier right. for people who might have long working jobs where they can't necessarily just come in mm -hmm. to a voting center to cast a ballot. So having our different voting system here in Oregon is a real benefit, I feel, to a lot of people, not just, not just immigrants, but also people who are elderly who may have trouble moving in their homes. It's much easier for them to vote there than it would be to have to drive, especially because some people don't feel comfortable driving at night once they become older. Mm -hmm. So being able to just vote in their home and mail it mm -hmm. in is an easier way, I think, for people to participate in our democracy. Yeah, I do like it personally, for sure. Um, how does the environmental justice work tie into border relief and immigrant aid? Well, a good number of immigrants who come to the United States work in agriculture, as uh, Bianca previously mentioned. Mm -hmm. And what I largely do at UNITE in regards to the environmental aspects is to try and reduce exposure to pesticides for agricultural workers because a lot of immigrants right. wor work in agriculture and can become sick or develop cancer down the road due to extreme exposure mm -hmm. to various pesticides. That's largely how we have environmental justice play in, but there are some other aspects as well that affect how people live and also just in their homes, being exposed to pesticide for your children or for your fa other family members who live with you can be a real problem, especially because most pesticides tend to stick to the work clothes and the boots and the skin, of course, of the farm workers or other day laborers who are out in the fields. And so once they come home, they have to do special things such as put whatever clothes they're carrying in a special basket so they can be washed separately. And they also need to try and wash themselves to reduce their own exposure to these potentially dangerous chemicals. And so there's just a lot of ways that environmental organizing impacts the immigrant community, but mm -hmm. the way that I focus on a lot at UNITE is through this exposure via pesticides while working. Thank you. And that brings us to the next question, Bianca. Uh, maps like the one currently released by the Environmental Health Alliance clearly illuminates that minorities reside much closer proximity to hazardous admissions. Um, how does your work with environmental organization tie into immigrant aid and border relief? Um, you know, similar to, as Nick was describing, uh, our work with environmental justice at Beyond Toxics, we focus on clean air and clean water for everyone, regardless of race, class, gender, um, or any privilege or power. So, and what we've really noticed is that um, immigrant communities and, and communities of color and low-income communities uh, tend to have the least access to clean air, clean water. And, um, and so we don't work directly with the border and the border crisis, but once people mm -hmm. do come, they, they immigrate here, they seek refuge, they tend to be then pushed out into the lesser, the lower income um, parts of cities. Um, which are also the industrial zones, and then they tend to work in those industrial zones too, um, as well as agriculture. Yeah. And so you have people working in the most toxic uh, parts of, of our industry and economy, as well as living in those toxic areas too. So um, they, mm -hmm. they just experience greater pollutants, chemicals, um, pesticides at home and in the workplace, sure. and also groundwater contamination, um, so air and water. And um, so we, we advocate on behalf of, of communities. We are, more of our work is focusing on uh, climate refugees and immigrants um, since they are, in a way, the canaries in the coal mine. Uh, they are the ones who are really pushed to the outskirts where um, these manufacturing plants are, um, where these chemicals and toxins mm -hmm. that are affecting all of us, but, um, but really experiencing, ex uh, affecting them on the front line. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, Catherine, since June, a lot has changed at the Mexican border and due to um, a tightening up at the Guatemalan border as well. And so 
uh, different countries are getting affected. Originally, you worked for the San Diego Rapid Response Network. What, how, what has changed to make this a less viable way for people to help? And what would make, what is a better suggestion? <clears throat> well, um, in January, I went down to the San Diego area to work for the San Diego Rapid Response Network. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the situation at the time was very different. People seeking asylum, once they had gone through part of the hurdles that the process puts them through and were able to come to the United States and be with their sponsors until their uh, hearing date, which could be a year later, happened. Um, uh, so there was a process whereby they would um, go through some of the steps. They would be bussed by ICE up to the San Diego area, and they'd arrive at this shelter, and that's where I worked. The shelter was uh, operated by the Jewish Family Services, mm -hmm. and it um, 100 people a day would come through, maybe more. I was only there for, for a couple of days. And um, they would do uh, intake interviews with them, they would, um, volunteers would contact their sponsors and make travel arrangements and then take them to the, the bus or the, the plane so they could go t to their sponsors. Um, this shelter also provided, it had great big dorm rooms and uh, a big kitchen, lots of meals, donated clothes, a mm -hmm. medical clinic, childcare. And uh, what I was doing down there, because my Spanish was not good enough to do the intake interviews, was uh, I was photocopying documents and um, working in the kitchen. Um, so back then they needed a lot of volunteers mm -hmm. because floods of people were coming through. But with the Remain in Mexico policy mm -hmm. that um, has come into effect, the spigot has right. stopped, kind of slowed down. And um, so they, uh, they don't need as many volunteers as they used uh -huh. to, but they, they do need volunteers. It's just that you can't say, oh, can, can a group of six of us come in February for a week? Because they don't know what the situation right. will be like in February. So it's harder for people from far away to volunteer, but it is not impossible. Uh -huh. Yeah. And you suggested, since that isn't the spigot is closed, as you said, for that. Um, the World Central Kitchen, if people wanted to go help at the border, is a good way. Right. Yeah. World Central Kitchen uh, is in Tijuana. I did not volunteer there, mm -hmm. um, but they, um, they are kind of a pop-up kitchen that, do, that goes to disaster areas. Um, they went to Puerto Rico, and they, they serve 3,000 meals a day. So they have a great need for people wow. who can chop vegetables <laughs> and wash pots and pans, and you don't need Spanish for that. Okay. And there's one other group that um, people could could help out. Mm -hmm. um, while I was down um, in San Diego in January, I worked with a woman, a powerhouse named Bertie Gutierrez, who has started a Facebook group called bridge of love across the border and i think um the graphic is going to say bridges but it is bridge singular it's a facebook group and she um collects donations of clothing baby supplies anything that people who are now stuck in the shelters in tijuana might need and she's got a great network and so what i did when i helped her was um we opened up a whole storage unit full of um, bags of clothing and resorted them into men's, women's, and children. Got it all organized, and um, she was deeply grateful because she she basically works by herself. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you so much for going yeah. there and doing yeah. that. Thank you for that. All right. Well, um, John, do you know how many undocumented immigrants are currently living in the U.S. right now? Well, the best figures we have are from 2017. Uh, this is from the Pew Center and, and several government uh, uh, studies. And so in the United States in total, we have about 34 million lawful immigrants in this country, uh, which, in, which also include about roughly 1 million DACA recipients. Mm -hmm. uh, unauthorized 
it's harder to gauge, but the, the, the census or the consensus is it's about 10.5 million unauthorized immigrants living in the United States. Now, what's interesting is, is a lot of times uh, this administration and other people tend to conflate undocumented with Mexican. So um, when people talk undocumented, they're talking Mexican uh, undocumented people. That figure is only 4.9 million, which is down from their high in 2007 of 6.9 million. So what we're seeing is that over the course of years, for a number of reasons, Mexican immigration has slowed down tremendously. Yeah. And, and there's actually more people leaving the United mm -hmm. States for a variety of reasons versus entering. Also, it's not because border security is, is stricter. There's less apprehensions of Mexican nationals in 2017. So less people are trying to come into the United States. Um, now, the, because the it's bigger, better for them where they are? Uh, not necessarily better, but uh, uh, probably uh, it's a variety of reasons. Uh, one is um, they're treated better in their home country, so right. why would you come somewhere mm -hmm. uh, where, where you're seeing images of, of people being locked up? Uh, um, you know, there is some growth in the economy in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, so, so for a variety of reasons, we're seeing that number come down. And in the state of Oregon, we're seeing the same thing. Um, as the undocumented, as a complete population, in 2007, we had 150,000 undocumented people living in the state. That's down uh, to 100,000 in 2017. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing numbers going down. What we are seeing is, um, for the first time since 65, uh, uh, we're seeing that Mexicans are making up less than half of the undocumented population. We're seeing more numbers coming in from Asian countries. We're also seeing less people coming in illegally, more people overstaying visas. So they're coming in on, on perhaps tourist visas, student visas, worker visas and not leaving. Mm -hmm. So this, this myth of open borders, porous borders, and, and Mexicans running amok in the United States um, is, uh, goes contrary to the reality. Thank you. And you, are, you started focusing on family-based naturalization. Family-based immigration is, mm -hmm. uh, immig there's different ways one could immigrate to the United States. Uh, uh, there's diversity uh, visa. Um, uh, there is employment-based, so you're coming in because an employer needs a worker in a certain field. Um, you could come in through asylum, whether it be political uh, or otherwise. Um, and you could come in through family. There's an investment visa, the, what we used to call the million dollar visa. And that's uh, uh, Jared Kushner and his family came under fire for that when they were offering uh, opportunities in China for investors um, into their building to uh, get investment investor visas. Uh, but family-based immigration is, uh, has account for up to two thirds of all lawful immigration into this country. And so I, the, the, the thrust of immigration policy in this country since 1965 has been the reunification of families. Mm -hmm. And so it's something I, I deeply believe in. And uh, having started off as a nonprofit attorney with Catholic Charities for a number of years, uh, this was the population that we serviced. Mm -hmm. And it stayed with me. And, and in over 20 years of practice in this valley, I've never had to leave the family-based immigration uh, practice. I do naturalization DACA, but still the main thrust of my practice is family-based immigration. And it seems like the president is trying to do more of a merit-based system than family-based. It's like dependent on income, um, education, skills? It's, uh, he, he has um, championed uh, getting rid of the employment-based, mm -hmm. getting rid of diversity visas, getting rid of the family-based. Family-based, he wants to keep solely a spouse and minor children single of uh, 
U.S. citizens or residents. So he would lop off uh, parents of U.S. citizens, and, and they've been considered immediate relatives since 65. Hmm. So, uh, so he would like to reduce family-based immigration to less than a third of all lawful immigration into this country. Mm -hmm. Another manner he's trying to uh, um, completely dilute the current immigration laws is that he's introducing um, through the public charge test, which has been held right now by courts, but with the public charge, uh, there's an aspect of the process where you have to show that you will not be reliant on the government for support. Uh, there has been a recent attempt to expand that definition, but also say if you fall within that definition of a possible public charge, that they would go to a totality of the circumstances test. So they would look at a number of factors, including age, education, health, family size, uh, uh, English proficiency, so it smacks of the criteria for the merit-based system that he was championing. So basically what he's been able to do, or he's trying to do, is embed into the family-based system his merit-based system. Yeah. And so if you don't meet that totality of the circumstances test, you will not be allowed to enter the United States. So those people who are going to be able to come in, even through the family-based, mm -hmm. are going to be people who are well off. Yeah. 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 Yes. And that's why uh, Indivisible's uh, agenda is so important towards this cause to get him out of office. Indivisible and many yeah. others. Yeah, yes. and many, many others. others. Um, and what is the danger of just having this a merit-based system? Well, if you just have a merit-based system, first of all, uh, when, when Trump asked why we didn't have more immigrants from, was it uh, Sweden, I believe? Norway. Norway, yes. And, and uh, it was interesting because Western European countries uh, and Nordic countries were saying, we don't want to go to the United States. Uh, we, <laughs> yeah. we have health care here. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and so um, what would happen is if you go to this merit-based system, it's, it's a, essentially a way of shutting down immigration, legal immigration yeah. into this country. And that has ramifications for everyone. Right, right, First right. of all, in a valley like this, where we're so dependent on agricultural workers, mm -hmm. you're going to lose those workers. Second, for everyone, uh, immigration into the United States has help, helped offset the low birth rate in this country. So what does a low birth rate mean? It means lower people of working age, which is 15 to 64. So the less workers that are in the United States, the less taxpayers are in the United States, the less people contributing to Social Security, and the less people who are here to help our older, me becoming one of them, <laughs> uh, generations of, of U.S. citizens. So uh, by, by shutting down immigration, you're, you're cutting off our future livelihood. And it's not just for agricultural uh, um, businesses, but it's for everyone in the United States. Right. Thank you for that. Um, now I want to talk about the bill, the driver's license bill that got passed and UNITE's connection to that. Can you tell us about that bill? All right, so UNITE and a number of other organizations in the state have been working on something like the driver's license bill since 2007 when former governor Ted Kulingowski signed an executive order that removed all driving privileges from people without the proper legal status in the United States. And so one of the earlier efforts we had to try and get something like the driver's license bill passed became what was known as Measure 88 because there was a, a campaign by the Oregon Gonians for Immigration Reform, which is an anti-immigrant group, mm -hmm. to create a ballot initiative because previously it had already passed within the states the state congress mm -hmm. and so oregon gonians for immigration reform while working with um sal Escavel, one of our former representatives for the state managed to get it onto the ballot and measure 88 had a lot 
of money coming in to, because to vote yes on Measure 88 was to approve this change for driving privileges right. for people who had trouble proving that they could meet the Oregon driver's license standard, which was to have your birth certificates and other things. So it would have not only helped people who were immigrants, but it also would have helped people who didn't have current social security cards or other things who actually were U.S. citizens. Mm -hmm. But all the money came in, coming in to combat Measure 88 just spread a lot of lies about what the bill really meant. They were saying things that a person could get on an airplane if they showed their power bill or that all you have to do is show that you're getting like a phone bill to come into the DMV and all of a sudden all these immigrants, they're going to be able to be able to get a driver's license. And someone who's born in Oregon, oh, they'll have to do this and that and all these other things. But that was not really what Measure 88 was about. It was only about giving drivers driving privileges. It wasn't really a form of identification So yeah, to these So UNITE it helped get that passed. That was on UNITE's agenda. Right. Correct. So, right. The, so the driver's license bill that recently passed actually was through the, again, through the state Congress. We and many other people throughout the state, such as uh, Pecun, or and the Farm Worker Union, and also CAUSA, worked quite diligently to help get our representatives to vote yes on this. It was thankful it managed to pass because it was actually during the walkout by the, I believe the 12 Republican representatives and senators for the state of Oregon, who thankfully came back with enough time to actually vote on the measure mm -hmm. and get it passed. Beautiful. That's super helpful for people here. And does anyone know what that means for voting rights? For the driver's license? Well, absolutely nothing for voting rights okay. because to, to be able to drive in the state of Oregon does not give you the ability to vote. Only U U.S. citizens can vote in this country. Okay. So um, what, what the driving bill does is it, it helps our economy. It makes everyone safer because uh, everyone on the road is going to know the rules of the law and the rules of the road and have insurance. But as far as voting, uh, uh, no, there's there's no ability to vote. Mm -hmm. the The voting card is going to look different from the driver, or the the I should say the driver's card is going to be very different from the driver's license. Uh, so you will visually be able to tell the difference. So all the 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 myth about doing this legitimizes someone's unlawful status. Quite honestly, if I'm law enforcement and I'm looking down at a driver's card. I'm figuring out that there's a good chance that you're undocumented if you have this card. So anyone that would be fooled into letting someone vote with a driver's card would have to be pretty yeah. tired. Right, right. Yes. Um, so how would someone get involved with UNITE if they wanted to? Well, would this there be a good avenue? Yes, there are a lot of ways to get involved with UNITE. Some of the best ways are just to reach out to us uh, either via calling us or looking us up online, mm -hmm. uh, U-N-E-T-E. -E. And also you can contact us via our email, uh, U-N-E-T-E -E Oregon at gmail.com. We have plenty of volunteer opportunities. Other ways uh, people can, re can help with UNITE is via a little coalition we have with Beyond Toxics and NAACP here in the state of Oregon called Local. And we're working to address certain environmental issues that affect people throughout the state, not just, um, we're primarily a people of color group, but we also want to tackle environmental issues that affect everyone in our state. Another way you can help is we have English classes and citizenship classes that we give for free to people who want them. And if people would like to be teachers to help with that, to help teach English of all levels, you don't necessarily have to be able to speak Spanish uh, it can right. it can be helpful, but we have all level of people wanting to come in to improve their English. So anyone's welcome to come and help with that. We have just a variety mm -hmm. of ways. And that's a great way to help in the valley. And if you want to help at the border, um, you went down with Al Otrolado. Can you tell right. us a little bit about that and how one might help through that organization? Sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, in May, I went down to Tijuana and uh, 
worked with Alo Trolado, which is um, a binational um, legal services organization. And the main thing they do is they provide a free legal clinic for asylum seekers that explains the intricacies of the asylum process. And uh, they also provide, um, they have a, a medical clinic, they provide some food, there's childcare, and uh, the, the people who come to the clinic have the opportunity to have an intake interview and talk to an immigration attorney. So I did that for five days. Um, people were, <clears throat> I thought that most of the people that I would be encountering would be from Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, because those were the countries that you heard about in the initial caravan. But the situation has changed. It's people from all over the world. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of people from Haiti. I met a man from Cameroon. There, I have heard of um, people from Azerbaijan, Iraq, mm -hmm. Afghanistan, Vietnam, Venezuela, uh, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and... So there's people from all over. Yes, there's people from all, it's a global yeah. Yeah, refugee it's a global, crisis. Wow. And they're all like stuck in yeah. Tijuana at this point. So that's um, a good place to go do relief work with this organization at least. Yes. Now, mm -hmm. um, my Spanish was not strong enough to conduct some of the interviews, so I did childcare. And um, they had a very well-stocked children's area with um, games, toys, coloring books, children's books. And at one point, uh, I found a little plush, um, I don't know, toy or something, and I threw it at one kid, and he kind of, <laughs> like, what's going on? And then he got it, and he threw it back, and then everybody else is going, what's going on? So we had a, like a five-person thing going, and their faces all lit up. Mm. Yeah. And it was so wonderful to see them have these moments of joy mm -hmm. after um, living all in shelters, them coming all this way. Um, wow. Meanwhile, yeah. <clears throat> one of the reasons they have the separate children's area is so that the kids can have that break. But it's mm -hmm. also because uh, their parents on the other side of the room are doing their interviews with um, the volunteers and they're telling the terrible stories of what started them on their journey and they don't wow. want their kids to hear. Wow. Wow, thank you so much. This might be a good avenue for someone who can speak Spanish to go yes. to Tijuana <clears throat> and do some border relief. Well, the main thing that you can bring to mm -hmm. all of this volunteer work, mm -hmm. um, the thing that they most need is people who can speak Spanish. But also because of the influx of refugees from all over the world, they need people who can speak French, Portuguese, Creole, big need for Creole because lots of Haitians are coming in. Uh, people who can speak indigenous languages of Guatemala. Uh, the wow. people who can speak the languages of Eritrea and Ethiopia. And uh, so if you have language ability and a little bit of time and want to volunteer, they can use your help. They also can use your help remotely for mm -hmm. translation purposes. So um, thank you so much. Yeah. And um, John. So you said the, that your main goal is to keep legal avenues open in order to keep it from being just like, how, what were the words you said? A border, like, run, or oh, sprint, yes. okay. or something like that. Right, what did you say? Um, oh, something. Yeah. That's... To just keep it um, from having a lot of people trying to cross illegally, and um, so that's your mission. And how could our viewers help assist in that mission that you have? There's, there's a number of ways people, people could help. Uh, you could help educate, uh, get educated 
Uh, uh, for instance, on uh, November 1st, I'll be giving a lecture on U.S. immigration policy and law, uh, talking about immigration being a global issue. So when you're talking about people coming in from different parts of Latin America or different parts of the world into the U.S., that's happening everywhere in the world. Immigration ultimately is a have versus a have-nots. So, so this is a global phenomena that we're seeing. So people need to educate themselves on that if they're interested in this. Um, I think also another way that, that people can um, help is, is by being a good neighbor, by voting. Voting is so essential. We can't undersell the importance of voting. We're here because a lot of people were disgruntled mm -hmm. in the U.S. system and figured things couldn't get any worse and they didn't see a difference between the two candidates we have. Well, we're seeing it. We're seeing it. Those of us who knew his stances on certain issues right. knew what was coming up mm -hmm. and, and it's playing out even worse than we imagined. But I think more important, I'd like to ask for people to be that agent of change. It's important to hear stories. It's important to have that good cleansing cry but let your compassion guide you into action. Do something, whether your help be financial, sharing your talents, or simply voting your conscience. We need your help to change this tide. With you and your help, we could once again become the beacon of hope that the United States has always been. And can we get the graphic for John's event? Can we pull that graphic up? Right, thank you. And um, what else can people do? This is for the panel to um, uh, people who have different skill sets, people coming with money, without money, um, people who might have a lot of time, or, you know. So, what is the best thing, you guys, the best advice you can give for people who want to help? I would love to. Um answer that you know in terms of just like things that people can do start it off with um, be a good neighbor recognize that immigrants are all over this country all over our community um, and in fact unless you're indigenous to this continent you and your ancestors were our immigrants so but immigrants in terms of like undocumented folks who are here currently or here trying to get here currently um, they're our neighbors we're family and so just have compassion um, do what you can to advocate for them. Recognize that they don't have legal representation. Um, they don't get to speak their voice um, the way that um, those who have U.S. citizenship do. Um, so advocate for them at work and at the rental market are like really easy, um, everyday sort of ways to advocate for them. They tend to be abused in the workplace and not receive equal wages. Um, and they also tend to have a harder time finding rentals. So just have that in mind. And when you can, speak up to them, um, to whoever's in charge. Um, of your of your work situation that's one idea uh, there's a group called legal services fund that helps uh, people who are trying to reapply for DACA because applying for DACA is not free it costs roughly five hundred dollars every two years and right now their fund is dried up so if you'd like to help them by donating some money it doesn't have to be all 500 but anything helps so they can get people to be able to reapply to keep their status and stay in the country through, via DACA. Another thing people can do is with UNITE, we have a donation page where you can, when you donate, indicate what you want the money to go to. So you can indicate you want to go to the border or to asylum <laughs> or to some other way to help people. And we can send that money to those specific groups who are at the border or who help with asylum specifically to help keep that funded and to give those services. Thank the you. groups I mentioned all have donate buttons, and uh -huh. um, they also have Amazon wish lists, which people can donate to. Um, the San Diego Rapid Response Network has a great need for people to step forward and be sponsors for asylum seekers who do not have a point of contact in the U.S. That's a six-month commitment. And there's also been suggestions like um, you can... I read in the article you said you you referenced in your speech um, how to help twenty ways to help immigrants. You can do things like donate your frequent flyer miles, um, 
Yeah, what are some and, of the other things she other mentioned? Other things is, it, it depends on your comfort level. There are certain things where you can uh, uh, lend out a room in your house, uh, right. where you could help uh, mm -hmm. sponsor someone who is in removal proceedings. So, so there, there are a variety of different ways that you could help. There's ways that you could help nationally. There's ways that you could help locally. Mm -hmm. uh, UNITE, Unite Oregon, uh, um, uh, Northwest Seasonal Workers are, are just some that come to mind. Uh, nonprofit Legal Services. Uh, there's different ways that we can incorporate your talents and your gifts because it's needed. It, it's, it's, we're carrying a heavy load and and it gets lonely and tiresome sometimes so uh, we always welcome the support thank you and at the end we're going to um, post a graphic that has all the websites connecting you to all the different organizations that we talked about today for those of you who are called to action um, is there anything else like pressing that you guys want to make sure you say to people who want to help I want to underline the importance of supporting these local organizations that support our local immigrant communities mm -hmm. because once people get here, helping at the border is extremely important um, as well as voting, registering to vote and then voting for just and fair immigration reform in 2020 as well as progressive politics overall is extremely important. But once immigrants actually get here, they need to be connected to resources, support, mental health services for all the trauma that they and their families have gone through, English classes, U.S. citizenship classes. So I think there's, it's really important to underline that there is no better way to support than supporting the immigrants in our community with these organizations. If you have money, uh, giving monthly and on a sustainable long-term basis is way more advantageous than just giving once, recognizing that these are, it's a long road for immigrants. All right. Yeah. And, and I would just like to add, going off of that, yes, what's happening on the border is, is tragic and, and we, need to, we need to put a stop to that. that that's the image we're, we're having of our country, of our values uh, put out to the world. Uh, but I also want to say that, that as Bianca is saying, let's not forget the 10.5 million people in this country right now. And let's not, it's easy to say it's an us versus them, but for years I've been saying them are us. And what I mean by that is there's 2.3 million families in the United States that are mixed status families. Mixed status families means that they're families that contain various combinations of citizens, lawful permanent residents, and people without status. So these are American families. So I have been busy for 20 years just doing family-based immigration law, which means that the people that are coming to me are American families. So when we're talking about deporting people, when we're talking about uh, uh, harsh penalties, let's realize that we're impacting American families. So that's the one thing I'd like to drive home. And I would like to, to end by saying, if you want to affect change at the top levels, join ORD2 Indivisible and help us uh, create positive change. Right, because the, pres the president is kind of a driving force in this whole yep. scenario. So removing the president is pretty key yep. to ending it. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for all the work thank that you. you do in coming here and sharing for other people who want to participate in um, just this civil justice movement. So thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank, thank you guys for watching. Another man in this battle for human existence Another statistic in these days of ballistic characteristics I think we missed it, the chance to cut the gluttonous kings We have the hooks on our mouths until our faces go green Another obscene scene, another scheme, another spleen Ordered by the New World King, another green-eyed monster Another ringmaster taught to another sleepwalking heart To a mantra of ignorance, the belligerent kings of war Turning America into an imperial land oh. Tell me where I'm going. Who are you? Tell me I'm doing wrong. Who are you? Tell me how I'm living is a 
sing over you Tell me how to sing